everybody. My name is Becky Van Tassel and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's FASD webcast, Creating a Culture of Respect, Exploring Gender and Sexual Diversity. This is part of a monthly series of webcasts on issues related to FASD. This webcast is part of FASD Cross Ministries Committee Initiative and 10-year FASD strategy to provide accessible educational sessions that cover a broad range of topics that are accessible to all Albertans. For more information about this series, check your emails for our regular updates or go to hslearningsseries.ca or by following us on Twitter at Alberta Human Services. You will be able to pose your questions to myself via our live chat window. I will address many of these questions at the end of our presentation. Paige Boudreau is our online moderator. She'll pose your web chat questions to our speakers. Today's session is also being recorded. And this video will be posted on the Alberta FASD website about two weeks after the live session. All right, let's get started. So as I mentioned, my name is Becky Van Tassel and I do work for the Calgary Sexual Health Center. Um, what we're going to be looking at today is gender and sexual orientation, and we're also going to be thinking about sexuality and disability. So to get us started, um, I'm just going to really talk about our agency a little bit. So Calgary Sexual Health Center is a pretty old agency. We've actually existed for 43 years. And we are a provincial organization with perhaps not the best name because we are not just Calgary located. So we believe in three main functions, and we look at working on healthy bodies, healthy relationships, and healthy communities. And we do this through a variety of services. Um, for all of you out there, I'd really encourage that you check out our website at www.calgarysexualhealth.ca. We have information there for people across the lifespan, including folks with developmental disabilities. Um, a couple of the key programs that I want to talk to you about today are our free and confidential counseling services. So if you are living um, in the Calgary area or working around Calgary, you can access free and ongoing confidential counseling for yourself and your clients. And now that might be of particular interest for those of you who are working in the field of FASD because all of our um, counselors are trained to work with folks with disabilities. So those services are free, confidential, and we currently don't have a wait list. Um, if you're outside of Calgary, you can also connect with us and we can look at different ways that we can provide counseling. Um, perhaps via email, maybe we could have a phone conversation with your client. Whatever it is you need, we are there to help. The other service that I think you could be particularly interested in is our professional training center. So I manage our training center and we've actually trained over 19,000 professionals across Canada since 2009. We offer a wide variety of services, um, specifically focusing on helping professionals become more comfortable talking about sex and sexuality with their clients. I don't know about you, but when I started in this field 16 years ago, no one prepared me to talk about this with my clients. And so my passion is to really help people feel more comfortable, confident, and aware in having these conversations. So the goal of today is to not only explore sexual and gender diversity, but to also give you practical tools that you can use when you're working with your, with your clients at home. Um, the core work that we have really at Calgary Sexual Health Center is based around education. So we see 10,000 unique students per year in our comprehensive sexual health programs. Uh, that means five and a half hours of curriculum for all of the junior and senior high schools um, in Calgary and around Calgary that are interested in receiving this service. I think that our curriculum is really fantastic because it talks about consent, healthy relationships, boundaries, STIs, stigma, gender and sexual orientation. Um, if you want any more information about any of our services, again, please uh, don't hesitate to go online. So if you are located in Calgary, you can always come and visit us. We are very conveniently located right by Chicken on the Way in Kensington. Mm -hmm. A lot of you might know that place. You could come and get some corn fritters and then walk up the street and pick up some free condoms, dental dams, internal condoms, and of course pregnancy tests. All of those services are just in our waiting room. Um, as you'll see right now too, we're looking at the front page of our website. So if you do have a sexual health question, you can always type that in. You can see that on the bottom right hand. Uh, somebody will get back to you within 24 hours during the business week. Um, the other thing too is that you can also click right on here to book an educator to come in and work with your um, either students or the other folks that you work with in the community. All right, so today 
We're gonna define and discuss sexual and gender diversity. We're gonna talk about how we can speak about this issue with our clients, and we're also gonna look at practical tools to foster a sense of inclusion. So my lovely friend Paige is going to be helping me out. Um, what I'll be asking of you participants today is to actually engage in a process of dialogue with me. Uh, I know this can seem a little bit weird because you're, you're sitting at your offices with a computer in front of you and I'm way away in freezing cold Edmonton, but we will be using the chat function pretty heavily. So how this will work is I'm gonna pose a question to you um, and Paige is actually so kind, she's sitting there and she'll be taking all of the responses and then she'll be sharing them back with the group. Um, I believe there's so much expertise in the community and I really wanna harness that. And so there will be a few moments where there's a pause, where we're waiting for folks, um, but that's your chance to, to drink some coffee, relax, uh, and just bear with us because I'm very curious about what you have to say. All right. So sexuality and disability. I think it's really important that we start looking at this topic um, in terms of how it is a social construction. So I'm gonna ask my very first question to Paige. Uh, the question that we're putting out there is how many folks work with people primarily with developmental disabilities? So if you have a thumbs up option on your chat screen, you can use the thumbs up. Um, if you can say yes, that works as well. And I'm just gonna give Paige a moment to collect those responses. And if she could give me a rough number, that would be helpful. And this time I get to drink some coffee too. It's strategic. This is also my way of making sure that the chat function is actually working. All right, so I'm getting a, a finger count from my friend Paige. Uh, it looks like there's growing number seven, 10, eight, nine, Okay, so my assumption is going to be that the great majority of you work with folks with developmental disabilities, pr primarily because this is an FASD uh, webcast. And so I thought before we really got into the content, we would explore both how we view sexuality and also how we view disability. So one of the projects that we've done at Calgary Sexual Health Center is we actually did a year-long pilot study uh, working with adults serving um, disability agencies in Calgary. So we went in and we provided training to all of their frontline staff. Uh, we did sexuality workshops directly with their clients. And then we provided sessions for their parents and guardians. And we did a pretty fulsome evaluation of this process. And we learned some really interesting things. Um, as part of the literature review for this project, we really talked about and learned that sexuality is so much more than sex. It's about who we are, how we walk, how we talk, how we move through the world. Um, it encompasses our whole being. But the literature strongly suggested that folks with developmental disabilities uh, are often not seen as sexual beings or as having rights um, to engage in relationships, to learn about their bodies, uh, to, to really engage in, in sexual behaviors with folks. Uh, this came out really strong that, that people feel like their bodies are being policed. So within our work, we worked with service providers to give them permission. Permission just to have the conversations, um, to answer the questions as they come up with their clients. We worked with guardians uh, on how to talk to their kids about sex and sexuality um, and their adult people in their lives. Um, how to foster dating and healthy relationships in ways that were safe and inclusive. And then finally, we worked directly with the folks uh, with developmental disabilities and they had so many great questions and I learned so much from them. I think it's really important that we center disability and sexuality in a rights-based approach. Um, folks with developmental disabilities have the same sexual health rights as anybody here in Canada. Unfortunately, in Alberta in particular, we do have a very sad and tragic um, history around eugenics and the policing of sexual health rights for people with disabilities. So I think that we have a responsibility as service providers to be providing correct information, to be helping folks find relationships, um, and really to be working towards inclusive practices. 
So on the um, PowerPoint in front of you on the slide there, you can see some of the research that we pulled up. And it was really kind of noted that professionals felt like they maybe didn't have those skills. So that's part of today, um, giving you those skills. But also you can always call or email me if you want to consult about a specific issue moving forward. So what we do know is that there's a really large need for people to be talking more about sexuality with their clients with disabilities. So I'm going to ask another question. Um, but I'll keep talking while you kind of give your answers. So what is the first thing or how do people view sexuality and disability in your experience? What do guardians say? Maybe what do parents say? What do other folks say? So what it, how do you associate sexuality and disability and how the public views that? So now I see Paige is looking at the chat screen. So she'll be, she'll be working on that. And I'll give her a moment. What I can do is actually read um, some of the really important research that came up while we're waiting. So Calgary Sexual Health Center borrows pretty heavily from transformational and feminist pedagogy. And the reason that we do this is that we feel like we need to really challenge um, some of the things that we've learned about sex and sexuality and uh, really examine the way society views sex and sexuality so that we feel comfortable having these conversations. And so that's what we're going to be doing today and that's what we did an awful lot of in the process. Okay, we're getting some answers. Paige. All right, so Sam said that guardians tend to be very nervous about it as their children come of age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's true and we saw that really strongly. Um, we know that people with developmental disabilities are at a disproportionate risk to experience sexual violence. We know this. Um, what we also know though is that if we don't provide people with information about sex, about their bodies, about relationships, we're actually putting them at greater risk. And so that's been a big part of our dialogue and conversation with guardians and parents is about how we must um, provide information so we can support the folks that we live with. Um, Kat was saying that uh, they view it as a non-existent issue. Mm -hmm. They act like people with disabilities should not have sexual feelings. Yeah. So I, Kat, that's a really important message. Uh, one of the things that came up really strongly in our focus groups and also directly with our work with clients is that they feel like people often will think they're either asexual um, and sometimes, or hypersexual. Uh, so it's very strange. We have this association that people with disabilities um, don't desire sex. Um, Kathy is saying that uh, people, particularly girls with uh, developmental disabilities, uh, do not have the capacity to consent, consent to sexual activity. That's what she's been hearing. Yeah, okay, so that is probably one of the most common things that I hear from folks. Um, and it's interesting because we view capacity for decision making somehow quite differently when it comes to sex and sexuality. And so a lot of people worry that folks won't be able to consent. Uh, my response to that is that if people have the right information and the right tools to make decisions, then they can actually consent in the same way that a neurotypical person would be able to. But that's often the excuse. So great point, Kathy. Anything else, Paige? Um, I have one more. Chris says that there's lots of issues with workers not wanting to allow pornography um, mm -hmm. because it means that they have to talk about it. Yeah. So I think um, what Chris is saying is really points back to a lot of the research that has really shown that um, support workers may not have the comfort or the skills or the ability to separate their own personal values uh, from this topic. And so it's true. Um, sometimes we hear of workers policing pornography, maybe saying that folks can't masturbate within a group living situation. And if we think about that, um, imagine if we said that to everyone, right? Uh, I want everybody right now to bear with me for a second, and you're lucky because I can't see you and you don't have to say anything, but I want you to think about something that you do that's very, very private to you. So imagine this thing, you wouldn't want to tell anybody else, get that in your brain. Okay. Now imagine you had to ask somebody permission before you went and did that. It's pretty unfair, hey? 
I think that a lot of times the folks that we work with don't have the same kind of privacy um, that you know, neurotypical folks do. And so all of the issues that you brought up are things that I've certainly experienced both in practice and in the literature. So we are going to be talking a little bit about that and then we're going to talk about how that further influences sexual and gender diversity. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to show you a little video. Um, and this video is actually made by Right to Love through the Disability Action Hall, which Calgary Sexual Health Center partners with. And uh, they have a wide variety of videos. If you want to take a look at them, you can see them on the Disability Action Hall's website. Um, and we'll come back, this video is a couple minutes long, so we'll come back and chat after. When people with disabilities have been kind of prevented from having the experience of creating friendships and dating, sometimes it's really hard to know what to do. Right now I'm trying to be honest with my feelings as I've never had a relationship with a woman. But but I don't there's there's ways and things you do around a woman. And I think it's harder for me being a loner. And I'm coming on my shawl quite a lot, but I just say, you know, there's got to be some way that you can meet women and meet other guys and they can become friends or you can have a relationship and do whatever you want to do. The, the wrong time of type of women that used to bum off me and used to use me for money and sex and that. And, and um, uh, and 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 uh, I want to join something that will be enable me to to uh, to to, uh, to to go on dates yeah. and a place where I can go to learn how to date and how to to be compatible and be things like that. I understand the concept of sex. What I don't understand is how you get to having sex with a person. What are the steps and how do you go about it so that it's, it's an enjoyable experience for people and there's no repercussions after the matter? When people don't have a whole range of skill sets, sometimes then they, they act with each other in ways that can end up hurting each other and um, so you, you can have a really negative fallout that way too. One in four people with a disability will be sexually abused. Women with disabilities are four times more likely to be sexually assaulted compared to women without disabilities. A very small number of people in Alberta will have the support to be in a relationship or have a healthy sexual experience. When I attended the Disability Summit in Edmonton, and I heard self-advocates speak about the challenges that they have of having parents or family members accept their relationship and their need for wanting to be in an intimate relationship. It made me really sad because I believe that every person has a right to be loved and to love. We had a conversation with one service provider who said, oh yeah, yeah, we support people with disabilities having overnight guests in their homes, except for it presents a um, health and safety risk. Because if there was a fire, we wouldn't be able to get everyone out because of the staffing. Like, they went into this huge, long, yeah, bullshit excuse. kind of mm -hmm. excuse that had built up over the years and may have had some base, who knows but they clearly weren't going to start looking at how can we break this barrier down. It was purposely left there so they didn't have to deal with the fact that there might be two people in that room having sex mm -hmm. and they couldn't handle it. People with disabilities have sex and funny stories just like anybody else and it happens in similar and unique and funny ways. Unfortunately, I believe that there are still a lot of people in our society that have a very difficult time accepting relationships uh, of 
for people with um, disabilities. Well, sometimes parents who are act as people's guardians legally, sometimes and sometimes not, often have strong opinions and always take it right to the end. I don't want my son or daughter having sex, not even giving them the opportunity to have relationships and friendships first and move into that. The law side caregivers, parents, or guardians hold a lot of power. Support workers are often silenced because they are af afraid of losing their jobs or it's not in their job description. Have there been supportive people in your life who've supported your, your right to love? Mm. Yeah. Who, who? My, my roommate. Okay. Although he He's not doing much on the relationship part. He says he can't find me somebody because that's not his job, he says. Okay. His brother said the same thing, and they suggested go to the DDOC dance, and I okay. tried to look for love at the DDOC dance, and no go. Okay. There isn't new programs being created. There isn't supports for this. That people are just trying to hang on to the level of support that they have. So I think it's really frustrating to think about full citizenship in a time when clearly services are being decimated and um, people aren't even getting the basic services they need, let alone what is critical in terms of quality of life services. Some, you know, attitudinal shifts that really need to happen before I think mm -hmm. just broadly people are seen as sexual beings who have, this is a right, and we create opportunities for them. Okay, so I hope that you found that video valuable. Uh, like I said, the Disability Action Hall and Right to Love is a really amazing resource. Um, they do meet at Calgary Sexual Health Center and one of the most amazing things that they did is they actually just challenged the Marriage Act and won. So I would really encourage you to, um, to go and look at some of their resources and their materials. So, I'm going to ask folks uh, just to think a little bit about how they felt watching that video. What was their initial reaction? So one word, one feeling from what you felt while watching that. And you can type that into our lovely assistant page. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about sexuality. So as you can see, there are two monkeys uh, on your screen. And one of the things that I think we do as a society that's really um, problematic is we equate sexuality with sex. We think about it in terms of just the act and that sexuality really isn't um, inclusive of all that it is. So when we talk about sexuality with folks with developmental disabilities it's so much more than talking about sex. It's talking about healthy relationships, gender identity, sexual orientation, spirituality, our values, our culture, boundaries, it's really everything. And oftentimes when we talk to guardians about wanting to address sexuality, the first thing that they think of is this. So part of our role as service providers is to challenge that idea and to talk about what it really means to address sexuality. So it looks like we got some answers from Paige. Um, so some of the things that people are feeling are lonely, sad, disheartened, frustrated, um, they were also saying eye-opening, and mm -hmm. uh, Wendy said red tape. Yeah. I think that, that all of those feelings are absolutely true and absolutely real. And what it means to me and why I feel so passionate about this work is that there's still so much to be done. And unfortunately, um, a lot of it does end up getting caught up in red tape or funding costs. Um, but it is such a, a major issue. If we talk about true community inclusion and participation, Part of that is fostering healthy sexuality, healthy relationships. And so that's why, to me, this topic is so near and dear. 
So again, this is what sexuality actually covers. Um, it's really about our feelings about ourself and others. Some of it is around our physical health, our reproductive anatomy, about our thoughts, our belief. Um, but a lot of it is, is so much more than we really give credit to what sexuality means. One of the things that I would strongly say is when we think about guardians or parents, sometimes it can be really easy to get frustrated. But to also have empathy that most of the time guardian, guardians and parents are just worried about protecting their loved ones. And so as service providers, I think one of the things that we can do is really help engage with um, all of the natural supports that are around the folks that we work with to understand that sexuality is all of these things. It's this whole, par it's this whole uh, parcel, if you will. So I wanna move more and really start thinking about gender and sexual diversity. So the next question that I have for folks is, how has sexual orientation and gender identity come up in your practice with people with disabilities? So that's a big question, and it's gonna take you a couple minutes to write, so I will keep talking, but think about this. How has disability and sexual orientation intersected in your work, okay? So I'm just gonna let Paige monitor that. <clears throat> And I'm gonna start talking about some of these concepts. So sex negativity is a really interesting concept and I think an important one for us to understand. Um, sex negativity is this idea that sex is shameful, that it's taboo, that it's wrong, right? Um, I like to think about switching things to sex positivity with a critical lens. So recognizing that while not all experiences around sex and sexuality will be positive, we need to move away from the shame-based language. Uh, we need to talk about sexuality as a positive, life-affirming aspect. Heterosexism and heterocentricism are um, a really important concepts for us to define. So an example of heterosexism would be if somebody were to run into somebody from high school, let's say they ran into a female person that they went to high school with, they might ask them, hey, are you married? And they would assume that that person was married to a man. So heterosexism is the assumption that all human beings are straight and further that that would be the preferred course of action. Obviously, there is way more sexual and gender diversity in the world. For example, 10 to 20% of the population actually identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. I want you to take a minute and think about the amount of clients you serve in your agencies. Are 10 to 20% of those folks out? If not, that might be something to think about. All right, looks like I have some responses. Paige? Alrighty, so first we have Sam and he's saying, there seems to be a lot of shame around sexual orientation, which is not dissimilar from the neurotypical population. Absolutely, I think that's a really good point, Shane. What else? Uh, Chelsea's saying uh, influence of worker sexuality on the client. Ah, interesting. So maybe um, if somebody's value system is very heterosexist and the assumption is all people will be straight, they might try to convince their client that they are straight. And in fact, we've actually had that come up um, at our agency in the past where people have called us saying, help my guardians or my uh, support staff aren't believing my sexual orientation. Yeah. Charity's mentioning uh, work with sex, sex offenders with lower cognitive functioning, often the victims are underage. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely true. Anything else? Um, we have um, Karen, she's saying people looking for financial aid from government to help with sex changes, the amount of time one must go through prior to the change. Yeah, so if we're looking at um, transitioning gender, that's a really important point. Um, for a person in Alberta to transition gender, uh, we are really lucky because medical services are in fact covered. Um, however, that is again, a lot of red tape and a lot of hoops that a person needs to go through. So for sure, we're back at that uh, bureaucratic piece. Um, and we have Brian saying, uh, we've moved to the GBA plus model of looking at gender and how it impacts our work. Within his work with children, he sees a lot of parents and caregivers who wonder how to support their children as they become older. They see at ages nine to 12, parents need support on how to be sensitive of gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Yeah, that's amazing. So I'm really excited to hear that there's other organizations and agencies that are taking this up. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about gender and the stages in which it develops. 
uh, because more and more now we're living in a society where people feel safer to come out. And so we're seeing um, kids coming out younger and younger. So that's great. Um, homophobia, I think, is a really interesting term because it sounds not as bad as it really is. Uh, homophobia to me is actually hatred or oppression towards anybody who identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, queer, um, whatever their identity may be. And homophobia can oftentimes be policies. So we may see homophobia acted out in group care situations where, say, um, there's policy that uh, two people in a relationship aren't a allowed to be alone in a specific space. And sometimes that can be heightened if those two people happen to belong to the same gender. Uh, transphobia, I think, is a really important one to address because it's very uh, pervasive in our society. So transphobia would be the um, hatred and oppression, uh, stigmatization or discrimination against um, people who are transgender. And we see this in a lot of day-to-day uh, -day practices. For example, only having uh, male and female washrooms. That's an example of transphobia. Um, having gender-specific programming that's exclusionary uh, to people who might not identify as male or female. We're going to talk about that. And finally, biphobia. Um, biphobia, I think, is still very common. And it, sometimes it can be seen as the denial that bisexual people exist. So people might say things like, oh, you know, they're just on their way to being straight or gay or lesbian or whatever that might be. So I want you to think about this quite personally. Um, how do we see this happening in our day to day? And maybe not right now, but after this session, I would love you to reflect upon your own agency. Um, is there areas where this might be occurring in our policies and our practices? And if so, what can we do? So I want to look at some definitions right now. Um, I want to look at the definition of sex, the definition of gender, and the definition of sexual orientation. So normally, I would have you um, come up with these on your own. But unfortunately, that would be very, very difficult for Paige to moderate. So I'm going to go through this quite simply. Um, I want to be really clear right now that well, I'm going to present this in the most plain language, basic way that I can. I by no means am going to touch on every identity, and I don't mean to uh, essentialize anybody's identity in this process. Um, I'm also going to be putting this in very plain language so that you can use this particularly with your clients to help talk about some of these issues. So I, I just want to be very clear that I'm taking a pretty complex experience and paring it down to a slide. So there's no way that I can do that justice. Um, people do their entire PhD dissertations on gender, sex, sexual orientation, and you're getting a two-minute slide. So I will do my best. So I want to look at this little human. We see they have a head, a heart, and a body. And so I want to start with the heart. So the heart is where sexual orientation lives. And why do you think that is? What do we do with our hearts? Well, we love, of course. And so our orientation is something we're born with. It's about who we're attracted to, who turns us on, who lights us up, who floats our boat, whatever way that you want to describe that. And that's in the heart, OK? Um, how people might identify within their sexual orientation is kind of up to them. So some people might identify as a lesbian. And so that typically is a woman attracted to other women, a gay typically attracted to the same gender, bisexual, both, uh, heterosexual or straight, opposite, asexual. So asexual folks uh, might not be sexually lit up by other people, but they still might have romantic relationships. They might still date, they might still masturbate, um, but they're just not you know, sexually charged by others. Pansexual folks, to me, are the most open-minded of folks uh, in the sexual orientation kind of spectrum. So pansexual folks are attracted to people based on who they are. It's not about how they look or what their gender is. They're really attracted to people based on who they are at the core of their identity. And queer, I think, is a really um, interesting term. It's an umbrella term. So for some folks maybe uh, who are a little bit older, they'll remember queer being a really negative term in terminology. But what's happened is that some folks have reclaimed that term to be quite positive. And now it's actually become quite a political term. So the thing about queer is we don't 
and really all of these, we don't get to tell somebody else what their orientation or identity is. Um, that's something that folks determine on their own, okay? So that's orientation. Again, that's who lights us up, who turns us on. Uh, I wanna direct your attention to the star, and the star is what we're gonna call the sex assigned at birth. So I don't know if anybody here has been to a gender reveal party before, but essentially a gender reveal party is where somebody is gonna bring a cake and they're gonna cut open that cake and inside they're gonna see blue or pink. So the thing about that is they're actually having a sex assigned at birth party because they're basing all of that on the genitals that are seen in an ultrasound, okay? So sex assigned at birth, we assign typically based on what we see. So um, if we assign somebody male, it's because they were likely born with a penis, okay? If we assign someone female sex, it's because they were born with a penis or a vulva. A person might also be assigned intersex, born intersex, um, which could mean a variety of different things. So they might be born with ambiguous genitalia. Um, more often than not though, people are born intersex and they actually don't know, which is why also it's sex assigned at birth, because we actually might find out that that was wrong. So for example, a person might be born with a vulva and a vagina, but inside they have testicles. Okay, this is actually pretty common. Lots of different ways that sex occurs, um, but a person wouldn't know that necessarily. So sex is about our genitals, our chromosomes, our hormones, our primary and secondary sex characteristics. And again, it's something we assign at birth. Gender is actually totally separate from our sex, okay? So gender is, is how we feel. It's how we know who we are. Um, gender is also taught to us. So we might talk about how men and women are supposed to behave or be. But gender is really interesting because we're actually all born and develop a sense of gender that's highly internal. Um, and then we're also taught gender a little bit. So I don't know if anybody knows when gender starts to develop for folks, but it's typically around age, between the ages of three and five. And every single person in the world actually goes through this process. So at around three or five, somebody will say, hey, parent or guardian, whoever's in my life, um, I'm a girl. And if that person was born with a vulva and vagina and their sex assigned at birth was girl, as a society, what do we typically say? Yes, you are. You're a girl. So that person would be born cisgender. Okay? So their gender and their sex assigned at birth, they match. So, for example, a person might be born a cisgender woman. And for the most part, and they can go and use the bathroom that they want to use. Um, their ID is going to match their sex assigned at birth and their gender. Uh, in a way, this is where we start to see the beginning of cis privilege, okay? Some people though, at age three or four, are going to go to their parental figure and say, hey, guess what? I'm a boy. But their sex assigned at birth was actually a female. So what's the response from society typically around that? Is it the same as for cisgender people? No. Um, unfortunately, we might have parents who say, no, you're not right. And that child will continue to persist and tell people around them that this is their gender, because it is. And unfortunately, then they may have a hard time at school because they might not be able to use the bathroom that they want to be using. The name and the pronouns that their teachers are referring to them might not match. And so this is the beginning of transphobia, okay? The thing that I want everybody to understand is that we all develop a gender, but some of us um, are born cisgender, and so we have a lot of privilege around that. Whereas for transgender folks, our society creates systems and issues that make it a lot harder for those folks. That being said, um, parents can play a huge role in supporting their transgender or gender creative child um, to live a really happy, full life. And you, connect, you can connect with Calgary Sexual Health Centre for more information on that. Um, some people might identify as non-binary or gender fluid. And so this sometimes is helpful if I have something to write on, but if we imagine gender from masculine here and feminine here, 
let's say this person feels kind of somewhere else in that, in the middle of that. And so some people are born feeling neither male or female. And so they might identify as non-binary, gender fluid, or gender queer. And then if you see all around it, that's gender expression. So that's how somebody kind of, you know, puts themselves out into the world. So for example, my gender expression could be characterized as fairly feminine. Does that have anything to do with my gender identity, my sexual orientation, or my sex assigned at birth? No. These things are actually not at all related. Um, and one can't tell something about a person based on another. They're three totally separate things. So language is really important when you're working with folks. Um, respect the identity that they're bringing forward. If someone says, hey, I identify as whatever, and you don't know what that means, you have a couple of options. You could respectfully ask them what that means to them. Or even better, you can take charge of finding out what that means on your own. As professionals, we have a professional obligation to learn this stuff and to know this information. Um, we can't expect clients to be educating us. It's actually on our professional obligation to know things. So the other thing that's going to come up is, sorry about that, uh, we'll be looking at pronouns. So it's really important that we respect people's pronouns. So for example, my pro pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, some people's pronouns might be he, him, and his. Gender non-binary or gender variant folks might go by they, them, theirs. And then there's a couple other pronouns that are listed like z, their, theirs. So what's important is that we're actually asking everybody, what are the pronouns that you use? And then we're using those. Um, if you're not sure and all you have is a name, best case scenario is use the person's name. And that might not be their legal name, it might be the name that they've actually chosen and that they go with. All right, so I'm gonna pause because that was a lot of information. Does anybody have any questions at this moment? And if you do, you can send them to Paige and I'll do my best to kind of answer them. And I'm gonna take a sip of coffee and then start talking a little bit about some of the research. One of the things um, that I really wanna stress upon, and it, it did come up in some of your conversation a few minutes ago, we've had um, caregivers and also support workers contact our agency and say, I'm working with this um, person who has a developmental disability and they say that they identify as a lesbian. I don't think that developmentally they can know that. And so my response to that is that a person's Sexual orientation is something they're born with, and people will in fact know their own sexual orientation. Um, some folks might be in a process of questioning, and that's okay. Uh, we just wanna be there as professionals to support them through that process. But if a person says what their sexual orientation is, they know. The same goes by gender and gender identity. Um, I think oftentimes I've had people feel like a person with a disability might not be able to know that. And my argument is that absolutely they can. Any questions, Paige? All right, perfect. So I guess that my long lecture was clear enough for everybody. That's great. So what does the research say? Well, it says a lot of things. It says that there could be some policies that might be considered homophobic or transphobic. Um, again, I want you to reflect on some of the things that may happen in your agency that could be possibly homophobic or transphobic. Um, one of the things that we see very often is forms. When people walk into an agency, the first thing that they may do is fill out forms that ask for gender. What kind of gender do we usually ask for on these forms? Typically just male or female. And so that's going to be quite um, alienating right away for folks that don't fit into that. So I want you to keep thinking about some of the policies because we will come back to this um, in a little bit. So what research has shown us is that there are potential stressors that are unique to LGBTQ folks. Paige, did you have a question? Um, Dawn is wondering, what about when a person has a guardian and the guardian is very religious? Excellent. So that's an excellent, excellent question. So. Um, Calgary Sexual Health Center tries really hard to work from a place of enhancing natural supports. And so there's um, a really excellent website 
called the Family Resili or Family Acceptance Project. And that's some um, research that's headed up by Caitlin Ryan in the United States. And she talks about how do we foster family acceptance and support? And so one of the first things that she talks about is the importance of knowing we can't change someone's values. We can't change someone's attitudes, values, or beliefs. But as service providers, what we can do is talk to guardians about the impact that their rejecting behaviors can have on their youth. So we actually know that youth who aren't accepted by their families are nine times more likely to um, attempt or commit suicide, okay? It's a really important stat to share with families. Um, the other thing that we can talk to them about is what are the values within your religion about support, love, family? So tap into those potentially um, positive and affirming values to help the parents see how their religion um, should also actually be supporting this particular youth or adult, depending on um, who you're talking about. So there's quite a few different things that you could do, and I would say um, certainly we're open to consultation if you want to connect with us at Calgary Sexual Health Centre. And uh, definitely there is a really excellent report that was put out by the Family Acceptance Project that step-by-steps talks about different ways that you can connect with families around this issue. But that's a really excellent question. Um, to tie into that, I'm actually going to go into some of the potential stressors because these are really important things to talk about with guardians or natural supports um, or even support workers. If we're more supportive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans folks, uh, we mitigate a lot of these extra risks that I'm going to talk about. So one of the potential stressors is rejection. And uh, that's exactly what, what came up in that last question. Um, we also might see that people are made the focus of family dysfunction. So you might have a caregiver come in and say, um, you know, this person is gender creative and it's causing a lot of issues within the family. It's not about the gender creative individual, it's actually about the family as a system. Um, we do see that disproportionately LGBTQ folks experience homelessness and that is because unfortunately sometimes when people come out they do get kicked out of their houses. Uh, there is a higher increase in incidence of verbal and physical violence. School harassment, there was a report done um, a couple of years ago where they found out that 70% of students were hearing uh, derogatory slurs per day at their school about their sexual orientation. Um, we might see a lack of positive role models, so a lack of lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender um, adults that these folks can connect with. Finally, a lack of a safe space is a really important piece. So if someone can't be themselves at home, maybe they can't be themselves in their um, program within the community, at school, at their place of volunteerism, at their place of work, where do they feel accepted and safe? And so that's why it's so important for service providers to create safer spaces and to encourage natural supports for folks. Also, the internalization of hatred is something important to note. Um, research has shown that folks who are experiencing a great deal of stigma might start to internalize these um, belief systems. Because if you think about it, it would be very difficult if you heard rejecting behaviors from the media, your friends, your family, it'd be hard to separate yourself from that. So here's some of the other statistics, um, just to bring this, this home. So this report is from 2012. And uh, I think a couple key pieces are talking about how folks might be less likely to access health care because of fear of discrimination. And so I would think as service providers, that's an important one for us to notice. Uh, we have to be working extra hard to challenge internalized or perceived stigma that individuals may feel. And so we're gonna go over some strategies and things that we can do, but it's really on us to create the safer spaces for folks. And again, here's some more stats. Um, if you're working with a family that is rejecting, again, I would point to these stats and talk about um, the impact that research has shown rejection can have on young people. All right. I'm gonna skip that. So I wanna focus a little bit on what can you do. So I asked you to think about some of the policies or some of the things within your workplace um, that might not be supportive of gender variant, 
gender creative folks, transgender folks, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or queer folks. And I want you to start thinking about those. So what we're gonna do is um, you can type those in and share them. What Paige will do is not share your name. So we're actually gonna have no idea who's sharing what or where this information is coming from, but I think it's a, a good space for us to talk about some of the things we're seeing in practice. So I'm gonna give Paige a couple minutes um, to do that, and I'm just gonna keep moving through these slides. So what can you do as a professional? So if someone comes out to you, it's really important that you thank them, uh, say, I'm really glad you trusted me. Let them know that you are a safe person. The other thing is to stop um, and let them tell their story in a way that feels appropriate for them. It's really important that we don't force people to come out or talk about how they should be telling friends or family. Everybody's coming out process is individual and they're gonna move through it in a way that makes sense for them. Uh, sometimes I think we think, oh, if you just come out to everybody, your life will be great. And that might be true, um, but we need to respect everybody's process and momentum. So if someone comes out to you, remember that that's a hard thing to do, so thank them. Also remind them that what they tell you is private and confidential and that you're there to help them in ways that make sense for them. What else can you do? So on a personal level, you can clarify your own attitudes, values, and beliefs when it comes to sexuality and when it comes to this topic. Um, not only that, but you have an ethical responsibility to explore and challenge your beliefs. You also have an ethical responsibility um, to challenge things that you see occurring in your workspaces that might be infringing on people's rights. Uh, I would encourage you to continue educating yourself. There's lots of things that you can um, pick up on the internet to learn about this topic. You can certainly reach out to Calgary Sexual Health Center and we would love to have further conversations with you. Um, I would suggest that you connect folks to other organizations, role models and resources in your local area. Uh, work towards creating and maintaining safer spaces, which we're gonna talk about, and also be an advocate. Uh, use your voice as an ally. Okay, here's some of the things that are coming up. Thanks. Um, so one of the questions we have is, uh, are there any stats on Indigenous peoples or uh, on the reserves? Yes, so that's a really great question. Um, off the top of my mind, I can't think of any specific stats around that, uh, but the 10 to 20% is seen as like a kind of universal global experience of people's identities. Um, that being said though, the Native Youth Sexual Health Network has, they have a really excellent website and they talk um, quite a bit about two-spirit identities. And they talk about um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, uh, indigenous people. And so they share a lot of really great information and also have some, some stats and different things. So I would encourage you to look up their website as well. Um, I have another question here. Are there any specific shelters or addiction treatment centers for LGBTQ? Okay, so that's a really great question. Um, in Calgary, through the Boys and Girls Club, there is a specific program called Aura Host Homes. Uh, and that works specifically with LGBTQ youth. Um, in Edmonton, I know there is uh, some pickup towards people doing that and having a more specific space. One of the things that I would say around specific programming is that actually every single agency um, across the board that provides services should be lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender inclusive and should be working on creating safer spaces. So um, I think we all have a responsibility to, to creating those services for folks. And we're good on the question. Nobody wanted to share any of their own personal stuff, which is totally fine, I get it. Um, so what do we do to create a more positive culture? Well, there's a couple things. So we're gonna look at what a space looks like. So first of all, I want you to close your eyes, envision where you work, um, and imagine you walking into that space. So is there um, things within that environment that acknowledge uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender identities? So is your like public health campaigns, um, do those depict just heterosexual couples or is there some same-sex couples within those? Uh, rainbow flags can be a nice indicator that you know this is an inclusive space. What I'll say about rainbow flags though is please don't put these up unless all of your staff are truly comfortable in providing more inclusive or safer services. Uh, I think one of the most traumatizing things that a person can experience is if they go to a service provider 
thinking they're safe and then experiencing stigma from that organization or service provider, it could be much worse. Um, in terms of seeing, is there private spaces for people to talk? Uh, is there a, um, a place anywhere that's visible that folks can see what their human rights are at this organization? So, you know, posters that tell clients that their rights will be respected um, and human rights are protected regarding gender orientation or sexual orientation, gender identity, class, religion, race, socioeconomic status, ability, et cetera. Um, talking about human rights within a space is really important. It's also really great if folks walk in that they can see a place where they can put comments or suggestions. Um, this is really good because it allows service users to actually talk about what they need from a space. Um, and you know, as long as that's taken seriously, it can be a really uh, impactful piece of creating a safer space. So what do people hear in a safer space? Um, this one I think is a really great sort of tangible area where people can work from. So, for example, um, if folks are coming into a space, they should hear inclusive language. We should be asking people about partners. Um, our forms shouldn't assume gender identity and shouldn't assume heterosexuality. So, ideally, if we're having folks fill out forms, they should have blank spaces where they can write things. Um, are we asking all people what their pronouns are when they come in? Uh, this is a really great way of allowing people to um, provide their pronouns in, so that we don't misgender folks. Um, are we allowing people to disclose? If someone wants to come to us and talk to us about their sexuality, their sexual orientation, their gender identity, are we listening? That's a huge part of creating a safer space. Um, and it's really important to, especially if you offer like group care situation or if you're working in a, um, you know, a drop-in center, that homophobic, transphobic, sexist, racist language uh, it's not tolerated. And if someone says something, you use that as an opportunity to, to really educate the folks around you. Feeling. This one's really important. Um, so how do people feel within a safer space? Well, they feel like their identity is integral to who they are. Uh, they feel as if their identity is acknowledged. They feel that their sexual health rights are acknowledged. So if they, if they ask a service provider a question, that service provider is going to answer them honestly and openly. Um, the behavior of the staff should also recognize the unique stressors that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender folks might experience due to homophobia and transphobia. Um, that means they're acutely aware. They're working really hard to create a safer space. Um, they're being like very cognizant of their own language and their own values and how that might come out. So when you put those pieces together, the see, he, hear, or feel, uh, there's lots of things that folks can do to create a safer space for their service uh, users and for their clients. So what I want for you to do right now is if you can think of some little changes you might make, um, type those into the suggestion box so Paige can tell us what they are, and then we can uh, maybe learn from each other a little bit. And while that's happening, I just want to talk about allies. So what are allies? They're basically friends. Um, so an ally is a person who might identify as heterosexual, uh, but is really passionate about creating a safer space for folks. And so allies can um, advocate on behalf of clients. One of the most important things about allies, though, is they listen. Um, so they're going to ask what folks need. They're going to um, give people the space to engage in actions on their own and they're going to advocate on behalf of others. So I'm gonna give Paige another couple of seconds so some things folks will change and also questions. Now would be the time to type questions. Yeah? Sure, so um, we have a suggestion here uh, from Andrea to use preferred name and pronouns in case files. Absolutely. So that's a really, 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 really great suggestion. Um, and what that does is it, it, it means that a person's identity is respected. I would even tweak that a little bit and um, perhaps if you need it, have a space for legal name and then just name. Uh, try to remove preferred from um, all of our language. Any other ones? Um, we have a question here. How do I go about getting in-person training? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, so you can contact me and my email is bvanta 
S-S-E-L at calgarysexualhealth.ca. It's a long one. Uh, you can also find that on our website. And you can uh, email me and let me know kind of what you're looking for and uh, what your organization looks like, where you're located, and we can try to work something out. So we have another question from Brian. Um, it is, I work with children. We've worked to become supportive of the child as an individual. Um, and he, sorry, this is a comment. Uh, he really <laughs> likes the suggestion with forms uh, using blank spaces. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I'm also really happy to hear about organizations that are doing this work. I think it's really important and I think it acknowledges um, there's still work to do, but I love hearing that folks have taken this up. Anything else, Paige? Susan has a suggestion to review intake forms and allow yes. clients to identify undeclared uh, for the gender. That's great. Yeah, it's really great to take a look at all of your intake forms um, from a level of inclusion in all different areas and kind of think about if I were a client, how would I feel filling out this form, right? Um, and finally, Kathy uh, says, encourage images of same-sex couples in the caregiver recruiting literature. Yes, that's also excellent. Um, particularly if you're working with foster families, that can be a really good strategy. And just across the board, um, we should see uh, posters and health promotion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans folks in positive ways. Um, I think that's a really important and great message. Anything else? All right. So that's all I've got for you today, folks. Um, I want to thank you again for joining us. Stay tuned for information on our next sessions of the FASD website webcast. To get updates and registration information about each of the sessions, please email at us at FASD at gov.ab.ca and ask to be added to our mailing list. You can also find past and future webcasts at http dot slash slash fasd.alberta.ca or sign up at http dot slash slash hs learning series hs learning series dot ca. Uh, today's webcast was recorded and the video will be posted online along with videos from all other previous webcasts. The video link will be sent out to all registrants in the near future. We encourage you to share this video with anyone who you think might be interested. If you have feedback about today's webcast, please email us at fasd at gov.ab.ca and let us know. You will be receiving a feedback email from us. Please take the time to let us know what you thought of today's webcast. We'd love to hear your ideas. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, everybody.